For those who were fortunate enough to be in the room while Ariel was speaking, you know it's no exaggeration to say that there's not much more <laughs> that can be added to our understanding of the Parsha on top of his illuminating, truly erudite, incredibly mature Dvar Torah. And so I meant it when I said that Ariel was giving the sermon this morning. And consider mine just to be a, a short, short Dvar Torah, uh, not to take anything away from the substance of what he shared. I had occasion recently to see and reconnect and talk with one of my dearest friends and colleagues in the rabbinate, Rabbi Barry Dove Katz, who served in the congregation in New York for seven years before I ended up serving there for nine years. So I've mentioned his name many times before. We share each other's ideas from the, our respective bimas. He was my rabbi for the year when I was in my last year of rabbinical school and a member of his synagogue in Riverdale, New York, the only time in my adult life that I've actually been a lay person member of a synagogue. And then I went to the congregation that he had served before that. And so we have a lot of the same people in common. And those relationships are still strong. And we were reminiscing about something. I actually don't know how we got onto this topic, but we were remem reminiscing about how often in his seven and my nine years of serving Congregation Eitz Chaim in Monroe, New York, we took our blowtorch and went to someone's home and koshered it. It wasn't an every day or every week experience, but it wasn't an infrequent experience. A significant part of the work that we tried to do in that community was to make people or induce people or convince people to become more observant of religious law and to help transform their homes and their lives into something more committed to living a life of the Torah's regulations. And we swapped stories about koshering this home or that home and the pride that we felt in knowing that we had transformed a kitchen and that all the eating that would take place in that home after that would be under our indirect supervision. And that once a home is koshered, it's rarely reversed and so it's one of the things you can do as a religious leader that really lasts. And the pride we felt about that. And I remarked to him that it's interesting to reflect on the fact that I think in the 15 years that I've been at Temple Beth Am, I haven't koshered a single kitchen. And I was trying to figure out why. It could be, and I actually, these are really could, I don't know the answer. It could be that a higher plurality of the members of this community already keep a kosher home and don't need the rabbi to come in and kosher it compared to a community in the up upstate New York. It could be that some of my antipathy to what modern, industrialized, mechanized, sometimes racketeering kashrut has become has simply made it less of a soapbox issue for me. Not that I'm against kashrut, God forbid, but it just may not be as much of a focus of my rabbinate because there are so many elements of the modern kashrut industry that sicken me, actually, and turn me away from that idea. It may be that I have engaged in a subtle transformation that I wasn't really aware of while it was happening, and that compared to the first part of my career when I was young and optimistic, and I felt that the rabbi's word had great power, and that I had the power and therefore the obligation to transform an entire community towards Jewish observance and practice. It may be that in this stage of my career, not that God forbid I'm against bringing people closer to Jewish observance and practice, that I wonder about the impact of rabbinic words and authority on an individual person's behavior. And that I become aware that less than I'm committed in my active work these days to use the Torah's values and words to make people more Jewish, I have found that I'm focusing more time on using the concept of Judaism 
to make people more human and to eke from them a part of their humanity and a part of being in the world that may have little to do in that moment with what food they're putting into their mouth that is refined and elevated because of a thousand year old, thousands of year old exemplary tradition. This was not a conscious process on my part. But as I look at my teaching and my sermonizing and my pastoring, it does turn out that I'm doing it meaningfully different than I did 15, 20 years ago. Which made me, as I had this conversation this week, ponder for a second time a teaching that I came across early in the week that I shared at a Shiva Minyan. And I realized, and this sometimes happens as a teacher, you think that when you're sharing an idea or a teaching in a setting, you're mostly sharing it, at least you're trying to share it, for the people in whose presence you're sharing it. But sometimes after the fact, you realize that it's a teaching that you needed and that you were drawn to it for a particular reason. The teaching has to do with the juxtaposition of this week's Parsha, Parsha Tazria, which, as Ariel taught us, deals with skin diseases and discharges and oozing and the ancient Jewish way of understanding what that meant in a society and a person. On the heels of last week's Parsha, Parsha Shmini, which ended with the laws of Kashrut, which animals you can eat and which you can't, which fowl are kosher and which are not, how to distinguish between edible fish and inedible fish. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who was the founder of the Musar movement, the Eastern European movement that was trying to awaken an ethical immediacy within what was already a rather observant Jewish community, trying to find hints in every single word, in every single sentence, not only how to serve God ritually, but how the, your service of God ritually makes you more exemplary person. He gives a wonderful answer to that juxtaposition. If the Torah's order makes sense, why would we go from fish and hooves and swallowing cud and lists of birds we've never heard of to a skin disease that might break out on the body. And linking his comment to the very teaching that Ariel was referring to, that for the enormous majority of rabbinic understanding of what sarad is, it was a response to lashon hara, to using words to cut down rather than using words to build people up, he says the following thing. That juxtaposition is very important. Because lest you think that the apex of religious life is deciphering this heksher from that heksher, lest you think that the highest thing that God wants of you is to be careful about the things that go into your mouth, that teaching in Parsha Shmini is followed immediately by the repercussions of what will come to you as a person and as a family and as a society and as a nation if you're not careful about the things that come out of your mouth. And he says that while the Torah is indeed consumed, pun intended, by what you consume and the foods you devour, it's more consumed with the ways in which your words and your deeds might consume and devour someone else. And so Parsha Tazria is the perfect coda to Parshat Shmini to let you know that as you search out your hechshers and as you ask your rabbi perhaps what's kosher and what's not, and as you bring your rabbi even to your home to kosher it, if the rabbi is worth anything, he or she is as concerned, if not more concerned, not with what you eat, but who you are while you're eating, not with which rabbi's supervision you ate this piece of candy or this meat, but what theoretical rabbi would supervise and okay your speech about and to other people while you're eating and in between meals? I am the rabbit kashrut supervisor for this institution, 
And so I get to monitor and I get to be certain of all the foods that you consume while you're here. I have very little control over what you say while you're here, how you use your words either to heal or to hurt, and how the way in which you treat your fellow in this community, the ones with whom you are close and the ones with whom you are not close, the ones with whom you agree and the ones with whom you vehemently agree. I don't have a whole lot of control about how kosher that is. But I think I have an obligation to lift up that attempt at spiritual kashrut at least as high as the food-based kashrut over which I have ultimate authority. I've come to a place in my religious life and in my rabbinic life where truly more bothered and disturbed than I am about a non-observant Jew violating religious law. I am consumed and bothered by a religious Jew violating ethical law. That, to me, is an undoing of revelation and makes every bracha that's recited over glot kosher food inverted, perverted, and ultimately meaningless. So as we linger in Parshat Tazria, and particularly the rabbinic gloss on it for what it actually was about, it's a helpful reminder that we don't need once a month or once a week or once a day but every minute that the potential weapons of our mouths can be used against others to guide our speech towards goodness, guide our actions towards loftiness as the most significant kashrut that there is. And if there's anyone who is hearing this who wants me to come and kasha their home, I know where to find my blowtorch. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. <laughs>